Shalom. Welcome to Yeshiva Pirkei Shoshanim in, in association with Nativ. My name is Devon Mays. And I'm Diego Borco. Good morning, everybody. Um, today we are going to be talking about part two of a class dealing with animals and species, breeds, and seeds. So let me share my screen and we can get right into this. So animal issues number two, lesson 50, crossbreeding animals and grafting trees. So the introduction says in the last lesson, we review issues pertaining to causing pain to animals. In this lesson, we are going to examine mitzvot applying to animal crossbreeding and grafting trees. Bresa Sanhedrin 56b. A Bresa in Tractate Sanhedrin <clears throat> discusses the source of Noahide mitzvot to not crossbreed animals or graft different species of trees. The rabbis taught in a Bresa that seven commandments were given to the children of Noah. Justice, not cursing the divine name, not committing adultery, against acts of sexual immorality, against murder, against theft, and against eating a limb from a living animal. Rabbi Kananya ben Gamla says, also against eating blood taken from a live animal. Rabbi Kirka says, also against sterilization. Rabbi Shimon says, also against sorcery. Rabbi Yossi says, and Noahide is also warned against every act stated in the section on sorcery. <clears throat> the Talmud later rejects this proposition. Most later authorities understand the Talmud as rejecting this proposition. Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer says, Noahides are also warned against killing prohibited mixtures of species. Noahides are, however, permitted to wear clothing made from mixtures of wool and flax and to plant kalayim, meaning to plant different plant species of vegetation in the same plot. However, Noahides are permitted, prohibited from mating different species of animals and from grafting one species of tree onto another. The Talmud then embarks on a lengthy, detailed examination of the Torah sources and allusions to each of the propositions brought in the Bresa. On page 60a, the Talmud turns its attention to Rabbi Eliezer. From where is this derived that the Noahides may not crossbreed animals or grab different types of trees? Shmuel, offering an explanation of Rabbi Eliezer says, because the verse states, my decrees you shall observe, you shall not make your animal, mate your animal with another kind, you shall not plant your field with diverse species in a garment of mixed species. You shall, shall not come upon you. You shall not mate your animal with another kind. You shall not plant your field with diverse species, just as your animal prohibits mating. Your field prohibits grafting trees. Um, um, T. Hill, you could jump in at any time. Sanhedrin 60A elucidated. Let's take a closer look at Sanhedrin 60A. From where is this derived that Noahides may not crossbreed animals or grab different types of trees? Shmuel, offering an explanation of Rabbi Eliezer, says, because the verse states, my decrees you shall observe, you shall not mate your animal with another kind, you shall not plant your field with diverse species, and a garment of mixed species shall not come upon you. Compared to Leviticus 19, 19, Deuteronomy 22, 10 through 11, that record a Jewish prohibition against doing so. Also, <clears throat> Um, Rashi explains, my decrees you shall observe is an unusual turn of phrase for the Torah. Normally, God issues his decrees without any introduction. So whenever we see such a preface, we must um, question its purpose. Here it implies that these statutes were already known to man. God is only adjuring man to preserve them. Shmuel explains that these state these statutes are ancient Noahide pro prohibitions against crossbreeding species and grafting animals. Grafting, I'm sorry, and grafting trees. You should not mate your animal with another kind. You shall not plant your field with diverse species, just as your animal prohibits mating your field, prohibits grafting trees. Shmuel is telling us that the Hebrew expression, you shall not plant your field with diverse species, refers specifically to grafting trees in one's orchard and not 
to planting multiple species of plants in a single field. Rashi and Ridva explain <clears throat> that just as two animal species may not be joined by mating them, so two, two plant species may not be joined by mating, grafting them together. What about the last part of Leviticus 19.19, 19, pro prohibiting wearing mixtures? The, the Yad Ramah explains that the preface, my statutes, only comes to introduce the first two prohibitions, cross-bringing animals and cross-grafting trees, and not to the third prohibition of wearing kalayim, garments made of wool and linen. Therefore, Noahides may wear garments made of wool and linen, but Jews may not. Where were Noahides originally commanded in these mitzvot? According to Shemuel's interpretation of Rabbi Eliezer, the whole world was previously commanded against cross-breeding animals and grafting trees, cross-grafting trees. We know from Leviticus 19.19's preface, my decree show you shall observe that such a prior mitzvah existed. Is any evidence is any evidence of such a mitzvah found anywhere else in the Torah? Yes, it is. See Genesis 1, 11 to 12. Yeah, <clears throat> just to say something, uh, Dave, you know, this is a very interesting topic that we are, we are discussing today. Uh, on the surface, it looks like it's something very easy. You know, as you go deep into it, you see that actually what has been prohibited here, it's something that happens too often. I think last time you touched that uh, things, uh, animals like dogs, you know, they've been crossbred a lot where they will take a, a dog from Germany and uh, another one from another country and then, you know, and uh, mix, breed all these things. And at, <clears throat> on the surface, it looks like nothing wrong, you know, it's two dogs. So what, what's wrong there? But as we, we see here, such things are prohibited, you know. It went as far as talking about trees, plants, you know. So we need to be very, very careful of these things. I, as I said before that, I, <clears throat> my high school years, I did agriculture. And it was a norm for us to, to crossbreed different animals. So for us to achieve something, you know, maybe we want uh, uh, an animal that will be used for plowing, well, okay, we want an animal that is strong, we're going to mix, mix this and this and we'll get exactly an animal that will be used for that particular purpose. But this is not something that is uh, permitted. Another one that was very common was the one of uh, castrating. If you don't want this animal to mate with, uh, to, to mate or do whatever then and it you we want to use it for a certain purpose you know then we will castrate that animal but we see from what we are reading today that we should not be engaging in such practices of uh, castrating an animal unnecessary maybe let me put that word unnecessary castrating animals and also when it comes to mixing of different species that one we should shy away from it yeah, good point. Um, we we practice a lot of this in the states. <clears throat> People are always mixing, uh, especially dog breeds. Um, I'm sure they do it with other things, but we we know for sure dog breeds are, are are heavily mixed and for specific purposes to make hunting dogs and fighting dogs and different 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 areas of uh you know what, what people do. Um, one of the reasons um that this is prohibited to, in my humble opinion, is it's almost like playing God, trying to create some breed that somebody can put their name on and say, oh, I, I made this dog. He weighs 300 pounds. He's a lion hunting dog. And, you know, we just create him for our own purposes. So, yeah, good points. Um, and God and said, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I think if we even go as far in the science space, give it a name that will tell you about <clears throat> micro uh, evolution and ma macro evolution meaning mm -hmm. that small difference that changes that happens that can be introduced by this kind of things and uh, the one that is disputed of course is the the, the macro uh, evolution where we say 
uh, once upon a time there was a fish and that fish turned to a human being. Yeah. So the, the one that seems to be permitted even within Christian spaces and other religions is this mi micro uh, evolution where we say, no, it's fine. As long as there are small changes that are um, that we can see, there's nothing wrong. But I think this comes as a surprise to many people. As, as we have said before, these seven categories of laws, when you look at them first, you think to yourself, I mean, I left Christianity, I left other religions, and I'm here, and you're telling me that I just need seven. I mean, that will not be enough until you, you go deep into each uh, law and you see, okay, they are actually maybe close to 200 laws, if we were to count them, or 100 and you go deep into each of them. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that it's not seven laws, it's the seven categories. And in the category, you can go deep and deep and deep, and you can see how much you can bring out just by, even when we touched on idolatry and, you know, um, sex crimes, it's like there's so many different tiers to to it. So, yeah, the Torah is an ocean of information, and um, the digger you deep, the, the the digger you you dive into it you know what i mean the um the deeper you dive into it it, it um it, it can become a wormhole to where it just doesn't stop you know what i mean or the, the the people call it the rabbit hole you know what i mean you go down that rabbit hole and you end up in alice in wonderland you know so <laughs> it's very interesting so um it says and god said the earth shall sprout forth vegetation <clears throat> herbage that produces seed edible trees that produce fruit of their own species and the earth produce vegetation, herbage that produces seeds of its own species and trees that bear seed bearing fruit of their own species. We see here that even though, even, even though all herbage produced its own species, only the trees were actually commanded to produce fruit identical to their own species. From here, we have learned that Adam was charged with keeping animal species separate as well. Therefore, the original Noahide laws appear to have included these prohibitions. So one thing before I continue is Adam was in charge of a garden. And really, he was in charge of the earth because we had to make the earth a garden. We have to take care of the earth. You know what I mean? And um, it comes a lot of responsibility with that, you know. You, you got to know when to water the plants, when to, you know, you got to take get the weeds out because the weeds will overpower certain, you know, uh, plants in your garden and take over. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work and upkeep. So we're here to work. That, the, the, I think that's one of the things that we have to learn that Adam wasn't just given this paradise just to lay around and have fruit served to him. You know what I mean? We, um, he had a job to do. Now, he had a lot of privileges, of course, but he still had to, you know, keep the garden, this, which is, you know, which is a big responsibility. Maimonides, Maimonides and Hilkos Malachim 10 and 6 includes these prohibitions as part of the Noahide laws. According to the oral tradition, meaning the Halakha, the Moshe Misinai, Noahides are forbidden to crossbreed animals and graft different species of trees together. However, they are not executed for violating this prohibition. I think that's important to note because a lot of Noahide laws do have capital punishment associated with them. Um, and a lot of people that's coming out of Christianity, they feel that a lot of sins in the Torah our death penalty sins is why they needed, you know, to have this blood sacrifice from, from the, the idol that they worship, but everything is not a death sentence, <laughs> you know? So yeah, be clear on that. And so, you know, I had something, someone was actually blaming the Jews and say, I can see this Jews wants to kill the non-Jews. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> you say they they made sure that the punishment for all most of this of the seven co uh, commandments or mitzvot it's, it's it's a death penalty they want they want to kill non-jews and then one rabbi actually uh, replies says are you aware that jews have got even more laws that have got death penalty compared to what uh, the non-jews have and so it's not about that. It's what God has put there. We have more 
of the laws that requires your life than your laws. So it's not it's not like we we just we hate the non-Jews and therefore everything to do with them would be a capital uh, uh, sin. Right, and capital punishment can be a good deterrent. It keep people from breaking the law. So when people don't break the laws, you have a better society. So it's not that God just wants to. He says, I don't desire the death of anybody wicked. Ezekiel 18 clearly says that. I wish everybody to repent or, you know, don't and keep my laws and statutes and live. But he will punish. And if you know that you're going to get a penalty, then people are you know, less likely to break those laws. You know, most people don't steal because they know they're going to go to jail or they're going to get a heavy fine. You know, so America has thousands and thousands of laws and people don't complain about that. And we also have capital punishment. Now, when you're on the other end of that, it's different to where if you're not the one whose family member was killed or hurt or something, then those laws are, you look at them different opposed to, you know, um, if somebody breaks in your house, would you, would you like the law to be able to defend yourself and shoot them? Or are you against guns until something happens to you? You know what I mean? There, there's everything. When things happen to you, people change their tune, you know, That's, until you're, yeah. Yeah, until your ox is gore, you know what I'm saying? Like, until something happens to you, people look at things completely differently. So, you know, um, if somebody hurt somebody in your family and they killed them, you don't look at the death penalty as the same opposed to you just reading an article on the paper. Oh, they killed that man because he did something. You should, we shouldn't have the death penalty. We should have rehabilitation. And yeah, for certain circumstances, but sometimes, you know, in, in the countries that have the capital, capital punishment, um, it, they have less crime. That's just, you know, just, just pretty much how it works for, for, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule though, but overall these, these punishments are a deterrent to keep people from breaking the laws. Cause the Torah says you should put the evil away from you. You know what I mean? So if it says, so the people shall fear, see and fear and not do that. So when somebody sees somebody get punished, it's like, okay, maybe I should not do that. When, when Cora, and the rebellion that they did against uh, uh, Moses and Aaron, everybody saw what happened to them. You didn't really see those type of uprisings anymore. It's a deterrent, you know? So, yeah, um, good points. Um, yeah. Maybe then another thing that I would like to add is we, we, we know that Adam, a man, was given dominion over animals. But God, he is concerned about the welfare of animals. And so that's why all these commandments are clear of what we can do, because if we don't have guide, guide rails, we will end up doing things that are not good at all. And so that, that's why God gives us commandment to keep us in line to say, even though I give you dominion over animals, you can't treat them bad. You can't, you know, all about, always about you without thinking about the animals you need to think about the welfare of the animals. Yeah, you can't rule with an iron fist, right? You got to be considerate because animals have families. When, when, when a baby dies, you see the mother, you know, smelling it, licking it still. Like there's, they protect them, right? right? They, they got families too. So yeah, good point. At first glance, things appear straightforward. However, Maimonides' words include a subtle difficulty. He writes according to the oral tradition. Not according to Rabbi Eliezer or Shmuel, the fact demonstrates that Maimonides does not hold of the Talmudic exposition of this commandment. Explaining Maimonides. This difficulty is troubling for a number of reasons. Why does Maimonides not hold of Rabbi Eliezer, Shmuel's explanation of the laws? From where does he know that there is such a halakha if he does not hold of their derivation? Many, many pages have been written exploring Maimonides' learning of these prohibitions. This is a fascinating and advanced topic beyond the scope of this lesson. In short, there are many explanations and reactions to Maimonides. Some have even argued on Maimonides rejecting entirely the existence of any Noahide prohibitions on crossbreeding plants or animals. An important aspect of this difficulty is that Rabbi Eliezer is of a lone opinion. If Rabbi Eliezer is learning these prohibitions as direct biblical prohibitions, then he is de facto arguing from for an eighth Noahide law. 
this position would put would pit him against the majority of sages who hold on who only hold of seven. Therefore, the halakha cannot be Rabbi Eliezer Shmuel. Excuse me. On the other hand, Rabbi Eliezer's proposition, unlike many others in the same Raisa, i.e., against eating blood and sterilization, is not rejected by the Talmud. It is then possible. It is then possible that Maimonides understands Rabbi Eliezer Shmuel as offering as offering as 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 makta an allusion to these prohibitions and not an actual source for these prohibitions since they are not explicitly commanded in the torah they are not independent noahite laws but rather subsumed within one of the larger categories the question then becomes which of the larger categories includes these prohibitions rabbi shmuel Bar Kofni Gaon appears to place these prohibitions under the header Ever Man Hakai. However, the Ramah Mifano places them under the injunction against sexual immorality. Despite the dissenting arguments, most Poskim agree with, Ma 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 with Maimonides that Noahides may not crossbreed animals or graft trees. However, the uncertainties work to create leniencies in certain situations. A summary of the laws of crossbreeding animals and grafting different species of trees. Determining whether two species are the same or different. Torah law differs from modern science in its methods for classifying and identifying species of plants and animals. For example, many scientific taxonomists, taxonomists consider dogs, coyotes, and wolves to be of the same species. Halakha, however, does not. Therefore, one may not breed these animals to each other. The very general rule is the halakhic species determination follows the names of the items rather than their biological qualities. For example, even though a dog and a wolf may be biologically similar, one is called a dog and the other a wolf. They are therefore considered different species. This, this rule of following the name is only a general guideline and certainly does not help us for determining leniencies. For example, some citrus fruits even though they have different names, may be considered one species in halakha. Anytime there is a doubt as to whether two animals or two plants are considered the same species, a qualified rabbi should be consulted. <clears throat> and yes, just to say something. It, yeah, I, I was, was going to stop there too. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure. I was actually shocked when I found out that uh, the blessing that you say for when you eat a banana I thought you will say a blessing for, for fruits, but you say a blessing that you, you say when you eat vegetables. So uh, maybe something that we can look at it some other time, but the blessing for eating banana is actually for vegetables. So, so it means it's classified not under fruits. Even though it's a fruit tree. Yeah, so I actually, mm. I. I, I read the explanation somewhere, but I didn't go deep into it. Maybe it's mm. something that uh, we, we can look at. So, <clears throat> but maybe I, we can look at it, but what you were saying, I'm, I'm just trying to support what you're saying that we have our own way of identifying and classifying. Right, and right. Our own classification seems to be not really in accordance with the, the Torah and Halakha. And so it is always best that go with, uh, if you're not sure, consult a rabbi and he will class he will clarify things for you. That's exactly what I was going to say. Deuteronomy 17. If you have a case that's too difficult for you to understand, Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 14, clearly tells you go to the priest and the judges in those days, which would be our rabbis, <clears throat> Orthodox rabbis. To what does this apply? Um, broadly, this prohibition applies to all animals that mate via genital cloacal coupling. This would include all mammals, both land and sea, reptiles, and most amphibians and birds. This prohibition also applies to mating hybrid species with the pure species. For example, one may not mate a mule with a horse. The reason is that a hybrid species is considered a new species unto itself. One may, however, make two of the same hybrids provided that their mothers and fathers were respectively of the same species. For example, a mule whose mother is a donkey and a father and father is a horse may mate with another mule whose mother is a donkey and father is a horse. However, 
A mule whose mother is a donkey and father is a horse may not mate with a mule whose mother is a horse and father is a donkey. So there are some definitely um, things to consider when you're dealing with these these types of issues. It appears that these prohibitions. Yeah. That this sorry, prohibition. Of, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. On the chat, I I, I pasted a, a a link um into what we're talking about that actually banana is classified under vegetable so i can actually have affirm that it's actually classified under vegetables not fruits um, okay the link is for it's the it, it goes to habat.org but they've got a nice explanation for it there so this is just to go and to show you that um the, the, the halakha classify things completely different and so you might find yourself on the right wrong side of the law by assuming that uh, uh, maybe for example you, you banana and um, and orange they fall under the same category as you have stated already a dog and uh, you said a wolf mm -hmm. so you might with our own explanation we might classify them like that but <clears throat> and then we'll be in the wrong side of the law so always if you're not sure please uh, ask a rabbi if you don't have access to a rabbi please you can <clears throat> reach out to native and they should be able to help with clarifying things yes very very true um it appears that this prohibition applies to mating animals of different species even when they cannot produce viable offspring one may not crossbreed his own animals those of another or those that are ownerless Excuse me, so you just can't take stray dogs and start doing what you want to do with them, stray cats. It doesn't work. Excuse me, like that. How does one transgress crossbreeding animals? In order to transgress this mitzvah, one must directly cause the mating to occur by either placing the animals in the mating position or using means that will likely lead to mating. Putting them in the same cage, you know, isolating them with, with each other for an extended period of time. I'm sure there's different ways. Merely placing animals in a physical proximity, even though they may not, even though they may actually mate with each other, is not considered direct involvement and is permitted. So that's that's kind of you know not clear because if you're placing animals in a physical proximity, even though they may actually mate with each other, it might be the intention behind it if you didn't try to get them to do it you just say you know i i, I don't have a lot of time i got to put this dog with this wolf because I, I have to build a kennel but i have to leave i have to go somewhere i think intention might come into this because if you're placing things in the same if you put a male and a female of two different species there's a chance that they're going to mate so if you did it on purpose, it's probably different than if you just did it without even thinking about it. And, you know, because I, I know people who've uh, let their dog out, not thinking anything about it. And next thing you know, the neighbor's dog jumps the fence and now you got puppies, right? <laughs> you, you you wasn't trying to do that. Like I, I, I remember years ago, a friend of mine was told to watch another friend's dog. And he said, don't let the dog outside because the, the neighbor's dog keeps trying to mate with her. And he forgot, let the dog outside. Next thing you know, got puppies. And I don't even know if it was the same breed of dog. Like, it was a whole little thing. But, you know, so this, this could be that example. And it's not, it wasn't intentional, but it still happened, you know. So maybe maybe it's the intention behind that. Yeah. yeah. However, maybe, maybe, should... maybe, again, maybe again, what they're trying to talk about here is like maybe you own a, a dog and a, a cat you know i don't think uh, you should be that concerned about ha having them in the same house right could be because it says merely placing animals in physical proximity even though they may actually mate with each other is not considered direct involvement it's not di direct you didn't make them do it you just kind of put them next to each other probably not mm -hmm. even not thinking about it not you know <clears throat> You know, some yeah. things people are just like, it just wasn't on their mind. You know what I mean? Like you put a bird in a room with a squirrel, you're not thinking that they're going to do nothing. <laughs> like, who, you know what I mean? But 
and and I, I think I think intention has a lot to do with what, what's being stated here is why because it's not direct involvement. Um, however, one should avoid placing two animals of different species in physical proximity if it is almost certain that they will try to mate. For example, one should not place a male wolf in a pen with a female dog that is in heat. One should sim similarly, I can never say this word, similarly avoid placing a horse in a pen with a mule if it is likely that they will mate. So if you know something, uh, one of the animals is in heat, then you're kind of like, okay, you got to avoid that because you know there's a very high chance, right? Artificial insemination in genetic engineering. According to many post scheme, artificial insemination of one species with the semen of another transgresses this prohibition. An animal produced by such procedures has the status of a new hybridized species as mentioned above. So there's some interesting points being made here. It is questionable whether genetic engineering involving the manipulation and splicing of genes on a molecular level is included in this prohibition. This is an exceedingly complicated question that continues to evolve alongside the scientists that drives it. Hybrid offspring. The hybrid offspring may be kept and maintained by its owner. The animal is permitted for the animal is permitted or consumption. All the laws of Tsar by Lee Kaim apply to this animal. What is called tree, vine, and fruit. Any perennial plant with a trunk or a structure resembling a trunk is called a tree for the sake of this prohibition. Therefore, grapes, peaches, apples, blackberries, bananas, et cetera, are all called trees. This prohibition also applies to combinations of trees and fruit bearing vines. A vine is a plant that produces leaves and fruit, yet does not possess a trunk. It doesn't matter whether or not the vine is perennial. This would include many species we consider vegetables, such as tomatoes, gourds, cucumbers, et cetera. A fruit is another is anything the fruit or vine yields that may be used as sustenance for living creatures. Therefore, a tree or vine producing fruit that only animals eat, i.e., a boy's de arc tree, is included in this prohibition. However, trees that produce spices, cinnamon, for example, are not included. To which combinations does this prohibition apply? The prohibition of grafting different species only applies to the following combinations. A fruit tree grafted to a different species of fruit tree, a fruit tree grafted to a species of fruit bearing vine, a fruit bearing vine grafted to a species of fruit bearing tree. One may graft a fruit, one may graft a fruit bearing species of tree or vine to a non fruit bearing species of tree or vine. One may also graft two different species of fruit bearing vines to one another. Excuse me. The prohibition of graft grafting only applies to the parts of the plants or vines that are above ground. It does not apply to roots. If one grafts a tree or discovers a grafted tree on his property, <clears throat> when one buys property, he should examine the fruit trees and vines therein to ensure that none of them are grafted. Many species of trees are commonly grafted when, they're, when still in the nursery. For example, peach trees are almost always grafted onto almond stalks. Nectarines are commonly grafted onto peach or plum stalks. We will talk about the um, practicalities of this in the live class. If one finds a grafted tree or vine on, on his property, its law depends on whether or not the graft has yet fused. If the graft has fused, then one may keep the tree. However, the tree should not be watered, pruned, or maintained for its own benefit. We will discuss this more in the live lesson. Doing so is considered a contribution of, to is considered as contributing to the grafting process. If the graft is not yet fused, then the graft must be taken apart, even if this will cause the death of the plant. Before the graft has fused and is prohibited, before the graft has fused, it is also prohibited to uproot and replant the tree elsewhere. Once the graft has fused, the tree may be replanted. The fruit and branches of a hybrid tree. The fruit of a grafted tree or vine tree combination may be eaten. The branches of a hybrid tree may be cut and replanted. They are not themselves considered grafted entities. Rather, they are only, they are only the hybrid pr pr produce of such a graft. A branch from a grafted tree is like a hybrid animal considered a new species. It may not be grafted to either of its parent species. It may, however, be grafted to another identical hybrid. So we can see how complicated this topic is and 
for a lot of people who live in the city, this is not an issue that you probably would ever come up with. A lot of people live in apartments. They don't have land. They don't have trees. They don't have vines. They go to the store and they buy their food. They don't have no, they have no idea the process. Those grapes got in there little basket they bought they just know <laughs> i bought the grapes and this is my grapes right um and i'm not sure if it said it but i didn't really realize it said it like for instance are we allowed to mess with like stuff like seedless grapes seedless plants or, or, or certain type of foods that they're removing the seeds or they're making you know uh cotton candy flavored strawberries now and all kind of different stuff you know so what are the prohibitions against doing things like that these are all questions that the rabbis in these fields can probably answer for you if you need to know such information so we can see like we talked about before how deep the discussion can go and it makes you think about it because these these all these laws come back to us when it deals with cloning you know, some people want to become cyborgs and mix, you know, technology with our brains and all type of different different things. This is grafting. This is crossbreeding. You know what I mean? So what does that really mean for the future of mankind? Are we going to be mixing and splicing with animals and he's half man, half giraffe or whatever, you know, like what are we going to do so he could play basketball? Right. <laughs> what, are, what are we doing? with our species, if we're, if we're dealing with plants and animals like this, what are we doing with ourselves? You know, what is the law of the halakha of uh, a man crossbreeding with a, with a, with a robot or whatever, you know, cause people are doing some weird things these days. So these are just good, good questions and good discussion. I agree with you. I think this was very important that we go through it. And I hope people will learn a lot from this. Um, as you said, this is just a proof that these laws can get very complicated very quickly. And so it is important, it is your responsibility to learn what is required from you. If you don't learn, you will not know what is required of you. You cannot expect to know what uh, you need to do and what you are not allowed to do if you don't read. We are just here to try to introduce these topics and you go back and um, make your research on your own uh, with your study partner, if you do have, and also by attending the native classes so that you can get more uh, on these topics. Yeah, um, um, quick question for you. Where you live, is it real, is it city-based or is it a lot of land and, and or plants and trees and farms and stuff where you live? Yeah, so I live in a city, but uh, where I live, we I have got what you call a standalone house. So we've got different, we've got standalone, we've got flats. So the standalone, you will have trees. So in, uh, in my yard here, I've got probably four or five trees that are found here. Um, but they're not uh, fruit producing trees, you know, they, they're just there to, to provide shade. Uh, so I think um, it's, it's better that way, but for fruits that bear, um, for trees that bear fruits, you have to be very careful as we have already discussed. And so most of the places I would say they've got trees, you know, that people can eat and this will come handy to people here in South Africa, maybe in Africa, to understand that they cannot be crossbreeding, they cannot be mixing, whatever. It will come handy, but I'll know also that it will come as a surprise to many people. Yeah, because it, it's not specifically stated in the Torah. You have to, like I said, some things are derived from other laws, like, okay, if you can't do this over here, then maybe this applies to over here. And this is just Torah study. This is the, the, the Torah encourages you to study and ask questions and, and to learn the language. And when you learn the language, you, you learn the deepness of that. And even that leads to other questions and to learn more learning and more learning. So it's very complicated, but at the same time, very enriching and empowering of, of learning how the Torah works and how it all it all fits together. And even mm -hmm. though you got different uh, rabbis' opinions, there's leniencies and then there's strictnesses. 
you have to learn the difference of when you should be strict and when you should be lenient. If it's something that can cause problems, you want to be more strict. If it's something that's not a big problem, that's when the rabbis tend to be more lenient. So just learn the differences and, um, you know, ask questions, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. So uh, with that being said, um, we will see you guys next week. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom.